everybody, we're ready to start lesson plan three. And lesson plan three is going to be an exploration of Western philosophy and what the different uh, Western philosophers um, had to say about ethics. And there's a lot of Western philosophers. So which ones do we pick and choose? And so what I did was I utilized an article um, that covers kind of the Western philosophers in a very systematic way. Um, doesn't cover every aspect of them. There's not enough time in one lesson plan. You can just spend an entire semester or two on that, but just gives you a glimpse of perhaps what Socrates had to say, Plato had to say, Aristotle had to say, Immanuel Kant had to say, Jeremy Bentham had to say, Sartre had to say, and the list continues. So what I wanted to do is cover like 14 to 15 um, very briefly ethical uh, philosophers from the West, and we'll be covering Eastern philosophy in the next lesson plan. So let's begin by sharing my screen and moving you over to the lesson plan itself. And here we go, uh, Western ethical thinkers. So if you're a philosophy major, this would be a lesson plan you'd really want to concentrate on because you really need to know the different positions from these ethical thinkers um, all the way back to the Greco-Roman times here. So it's going to start with Socrates and we're going to go all the way through and bring us up to modern day times in the 20th century. I have modern day neural ethics, which is not in the article, but just pointing out that today we're going in a kind of an interesting direction in terms of ethics and studying the brain. Um, but starting here with Socrates, moving all the way through, these are called the three Socratic philosophers at Socrates, who was the teacher of Plato, who was the teacher of Aristotle, and then Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander to the Great. So I thought that was interesting to add that. We have uh, these philosophers here, um, which are called uh, like Greco-Roman philosophers. And we have um, Hobbes and Hume. We kind of jump ahead here. We go to Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. We have Spinoza and Immanuel Kant and Marx and Nietzsche. So that's all, and Sartre. So that's a lot of philosophers to cover. Um, let me scroll down one more time with you. Let me show you where um, we're pulling all this from. We're opening up this article here. It's a history of Western ethics. And I put into boxes these major players here. And I highlighted some key lines and underlined some key lines. It's not that you were to skip the rest. It's just making sure that that concept is fully grasped. So here we have Socrates and a little section on him. We have Plato and I highlighted some key ideas and the ring of Gyges we'll talk about. And we're moving to Aristotle and his concept of the golden mean and virtues and so forth. And then we move to what's called later uh, Greek and Roman ethics. And we have the Stoics and the Epicureans. We have Christian ethics. And really what I wanted to say here is here we have, it's quite interesting that Augustine pulled a lot of his ideas from Plato and kind of connected Platonic theory with Christian theory. And then we have Aquinas who does the same, but with Aristotle. And I just was trying to say that he's reconciling Aristotelian, Aristotelian views with the Christian doctrine. So that's kind of interesting. Then we move to what's called the British tradition. And this is Hobbes, um, all the way up to utilitarian. So Thomas Hobbes, I'm sure you've heard of Hobbes versus Locke in some political science classes. We have David Hume, who's a major player here. And then we uh, move to two utilitarians, which is Bentham and Mill. And um, finally, we head up to what's called continental tradition of Spinoza to Nietzsche, and we have uh, Spinoza, Immanuel Kant, Marx, and Nietzsche in there, and then we end. So there's a lot to cover here, and so let's begin. Let's scroll on up. Shoot, I have to scroll here and get you back to one more time and get you back to the notes. So let's begin. So um, Socrates, a drink of tea before I begin. Okay. Um, so Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, they both kind of, they all kind of argue under this um, time period that there was a, a position of sophism at that time, and they all kind of argue against it. And sophism, the sophists were, that translates as the wise ones. They believed they were wise because they argued for moral relativism. And Socrates, Plato, really challenge moral relativism. They argue against the sophists. Moral relativism is the idea that each culture, each society has its own set of moral laws, moral virtues, um, morality, and there's no absolute moral truth. And that they've come to that conclusion, the sophists came to that conclusion, um, because they basically observed that one society has their values as, as good and what they dislike is wrong, 
different than in other societies. And so Socrates and Plato particularly took um, offense to that, arguing that there is no moral relativism because that dismisses the whole concept of a moral truth to them. And they were in pursuit of that. Socrates and Plato didn't necessarily say they had moral truth, but it was a quest. It was a journey for them as philosophers. Remember the word philosophy is the love of wisdom, not claiming you have wisdom, but you are in pursuit of it. And so Socrates argued against the moral relativism that was popular in his day and age by the sophists. He argued there could be um, actually something called the good, but that he was in pursuit of it. He didn't know what it was. He was, I'm kind of covering some of the notes here. He supported what's called virtue ethics. And so Plato fits here, also Aristotle. It's this idea of virtue is excellence and we can in pursuit of living a moral life, reach our highest potential and be um, human beings with excellence and character. There's a famous motto that he's known for, and that's the motto, do not return evil for evil. So if you read um, Socrates, The Trial and Death of Socrates, which is uh, a story about his end days while he was arrested as a philosopher, he was arrested for critically thinking and challenging and he was put in jail. He was given an opportunity to escape, and this is in the Dialogues of Plato, it's recorded. Um, there's a story about Credo going to his jail saying, and this is one of his disciples saying, hey, Socrates, the guards were ready to look the other way. We've kind of paid them off. We've got you all set up to escape, and will you then continue on and be a philosopher and go live in hiding, but be a philosopher in another city? And he absolutely rejects that concept. Um, he's, he's concerned, Plato's, con I'm sorry, let me start over. Credo's concerned about what other people are going to say about him if he doesn't help his teacher. Socrates' rebuttal to that is, do not be worried about what other people say about you. It's not the opinion of the many that matter, but the few and the wise ones that matter. He also refused uh, to escape because he said that living a life of hiding is not the life he wanted to live as a philosopher, that he always argued he wasn't afraid of death and to go and escape and live um, recoiled away uh, in another town, hiding who his identity was, was a sign he was afraid of death. And so it was kind of hypocrisy. But another big argument he made was that he did not want to return evil for evil. So we thought that what was happening to him was not fair, okay? That he was being arrested and being put to death for being a thinker, that's certainly not fair. But returning evil for evil was something he did not want to do either. And that was, um, what he thought would be evil is, is escaping the, the actual law of the state of Athens. The state of Athens declared him to be guilty, declared him to be punished by death. Um, and to escape that was kind of to, to dismiss the whole concept of a social contract, his obligation to follow what the laws of Athens are. His whole life he has honored and respected the laws of Athens. He then, at a time it really applies to him, it really counts if he was to run away from that, would be doing evil for evil. So that was kind of an interesting um, story to add to understanding Socrates' position on morality. And then uh, Plato here, Plato has a lot to say. He also argued against the moral relativism of his time, argued, uh, supported by the sophists. He argued there was something called the good, okay? Um, and that we all come from the realm of the good, that we ourselves are good. So it's a very positive view of human nature, but somehow we've fallen into this world of the material and it's a bad copy of the realm of the good, so to speak. But we intuit good because we come from that original source of the good. So it almost has like a religious connotation here, but he doesn't reference gods or heavens or anything like that. Um, he argues that there's three parts to every human being. So we have reason <coughs> or the intelligent, we have motion or the heart region, and then we have the it or the desires, which is the stomach and below. And that reason should control, <coughs> I'm sorry, went down the wrong pipe. Reason should control and not emotions and not desires. So your actions should always be dominated um, by reason and control. And emotions are fine to have and desires are fine to have because those are part of the human being. But again, with reason and control. Somebody who's allowing emotions to control is presenting an emotional appeal, is not really thinking logically. Somebody's letting desires control. Well, we don't want to go there because that's not a good thing. So that whole concept of three parts to every individual, but reason and control. And the ring of Gyges is a very important argument that Plato makes. 
And it's during one of his, uh, in his, in his um, Republic book, I think it's book two, he has the story about the Ring of Gyges and it's kind of insightful. And it's the argument that, um, imagine you had a ring and you put it on and it can make you invisible. It's kind of like Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. I think that's what it was called. And you can do get away with anything. And so would you then, it's kind of a moral test for yourself. Would you try to get away with stuff? Imagine you're completely invisible. So you can steal, you can kill, you could um, you know, commit hor horrific crimes all under invisibility. And so would that change your actions? Would you act out of self-interest or would you truly have a sense of uh, a moral code and so forth? So the Ring of Gaijus is kind of this imaginary ring if you were to put on, it's a story that tells of somebody who put on the ring and then acts horrendously and acts purely out of self-interest. So Plato's kind of giving us a thought experiment to think about through that story and how would our action, what is our motive? Um, is our motive, are we avoiding doing, you know, horrific things just so we don't get caught or is there a sense of moral integrity there? And then happiness, how does that connect? So a lot of these philosophers are in pursuit of happiness. Certainly Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle have this concept of flourishing and living well. The Greek word is eudaimonia, and eudaimonia is living to your highest potential. And the person that lives a moral life um, is achieving um, a sense of happiness, a sense of uh, moral worth is connected to happiness. Okay, Aristotle here. Arist I'm just giving you guys a glimpse. I can't go into hours and hours of detail on each. So Aristotle. Aristotle was a student of Plato. When Plato uh, was, you know, when so oh, let me start over. When Socrates died, Plato takes off Athens and then returns to Athens like 12 years later and sets up the academy. And there Aristotle was a student. And then when Plato dies at the age of around 80, Aristotle kind of was a student but breaks away and starts his own school of thought called the Lyceum. <laughs> and offers, yes, he has a lot of Platonic ideas, but he offers a little bit of critique to Plato as well there. And Plato was very much a dualist of this world, the this world, I'm sorry, versus that world. He was very much this world versus more the metaphysical higher realm of the good, where Aristotle kind of grounds it all more in the natural world. He's kind of more of a, our scientist. Um, he also saw the goal is happiness, and you can achieve happiness or a state of well-being, a state of flourishing by... Um, virtual excellence, or I'm sorry, virtue or excellence in uh, intellectual aspects of your life or in moral virtues of your life. Intellectual virtue or excellence is somebody who pursues philosophy and thinks critically and utilizes reason and so forth. And moral excellence is somebody pursues moral virtue or ethics, and it's a necessary ingredient to happiness. So <laughs> how um, to be moral is to live a life of moderation. Aristotle wrote a book called Nicomachean Ethics, where he talks about moderation and never going to the extremes and through reason, knowing uh, how to act moral and pursuing a life of moderation. Um, so for instance, let me think of an example. You wouldn't want to be somebody who's, um, you know, really cowardly, acts really cowardly, um, always afraid, or somebody who's too rash and rushes in in a crazy way, somebody who's well-balanced, who know, knows appropriately how to act. You wouldn't want to be somebody who's, you know, too miserly on one extreme and never sharing, or somebody who's oversharing to the point where there's no boundaries, um, or they get themselves in trouble because they overshare, but somebody who's well-balanced. So that well-balanced approach, it reminds a lot of philosophers compare kind of Buddhist philosophy here with the, the middle path or even Confucian had this whole idea of the golden mean. So there's kind of parallels here with uh, Chinese philosophy, with Indian philosophy and with Greek philosophy. And then one other thing to say about Aristotle that was quite significant is his idea that um, it's not just knowing the good that makes us good. That's kind of a Plato idea. The idea of understanding the good transforms you but with Aristotle, it's not just the idea, it's the action itself, it's by habit. So yes, you can know the good, but not be good until you've actually acted upon it. So we, what we do, repeatedly do, um, let me start over. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellent then is not an act, but a habit. And so it's through action, it's through habit, that is what transforms you. And it's very positive message, it's very uh, inspiring because it's saying, 
you can transform yourself. I mean, you're not necessarily born good or born bad. It's through how you choose to live your life that makes who and what you are and your pursuit of excellence. Okay, Epicurus. Epicurus philosophy, now we're getting into what's called the Greco-Roman philosophy here of Epicurus and Epictetus. And Epicurean philosophy, the goal is tranquility, and the word is ataraxia, which means tranquility. It's living a life free of worry, free of stress, one of harmony. Um, and how do you attain that? You live, according to Epicurus, a very simple life. You live a life where you are not pursuing material things of the world. You're not pursuing vanity. You're not pursuing um, stuff. You're not pursuing ego. And instead, you're pursuing a life of a simplicity, a life of pleasure, and one free of pain. And what gives one's pain, um, what leads to a life of pain, is you've got your priorities wrong, okay? You've got what really you think matters really doesn't matter. So really understanding um, and focusing on what really matters, and that would be harmony, peace, tranquility, uh, lack of vanity, lack of material pursuits, lack of ego, and... Epicurus talks about the ideal um, is living kind of what he called the Epicurean garden. It's living with a few good friends, eating very simple. I think he had it like, you know, water, bread, grapes. I mean, not that he's arguing to live that simple of a life, but it's just simplicity in diet, simplicity in entertainment and all of that and, and a personal um, focus on what really matters. Epictetus is our Stoic philosopher. Uh, Stoicism really predates him back to Zeno. Um, the word stoic means porch, and it's the argument that Zeno articulated his philosophy off a what's called a porch, um, and it was picked up by Epictetus, which was the, a kind of a first century um, a Roman slave. He was actually enslaved and eventually won his freedom, and he realized that there's so much out of your control that all you could really do is surrender you have one thing in your control, it's your reaction to how life unfolds. And so it's the idea that roll with the punches, roll with how life unfolds, whether it's positive or negative, because it's ultimately out of your control. And it's also the interesting concept that sometimes what seems to be a blessing one day is a curse the next, and what's a curse one day could be a blessing the next. So don't have too much emotional reaction to it. Just accept, embrace, move on. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Islamic uh, philosophy and Islam means to surrender. And there's an Islamic term, kismut, which is that whole sense of surrendering to how life as it unfolds. Um, so the goal is tranquility and you could pursue it, tranquility in a peaceful life through wisdom and, um, and realizing uh, that life is ultimately manifested out of your control. You don't choose when you're born. You don't choose when you die unless there's some kind of self effort there. <laughs> Um, you don't choose a lot of things about your existence. And if you really think about it, it's almost like you're watching a picture show up your, as your life unfolds. And the best thing you could do is have the right attitude and disposition as it does so. And um, this is a philosophy that applies to the rich and the poor. We have it appealing to Epi uh, Epictetus, who was a very poor um, slave who, run, who gained his freedom. And we also it applying to the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, who was a very famous uh, Stoic philosopher. Now let's jump ahead here. Now we're moving to Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes argued for egoism. Hobbes is a very famous philosopher, very often studied in political science classes. Um, Hobbes argued for, we're on number six here, he argued that all our actions are ultimately connected to our own self-interest, egoism. There is really no such thing as altruism. That's a fiction, that's selfless action. Because even when I seem to be acting out of concern for the other, I'm really getting something out of it, he would say. He would point out that I'm feeling warm and fuzzy, or I'm doing it because I'm pursuing the concept of a heaven or avoiding bad karma. There's some kind of self-motivation there. And um, he argues that all human actions are self-motivated. So that's kind of an interesting uh, take on it. Politically, he studied when he's compared to John Locke. Um, so John, you know, John Locke and Hobbes had this completely different political systems that they set up and Locke is more for the social contract and human beings are basically social creatures where Hobbes is the social contract has to be in place to keep us um, controlled because we're basically asocial, we're basically egoistic creatures. Now we're going to move to number seven and this is David Hume and David Hume had a lot to say. He's famous for his idea that ethics is connected not to reason, okay, as Socrates and Plato would suggest, but it's connecting to emotions and our feelings are really what's dominating our, our ethical choices and our morality and our sentiments. 
and I really act uh, how, the way I act according to how it makes me feel. It's a whole concept of focusing on feelings. He has a very famous statement saying that no is implies an ought. So just because you see something in nature, let's say there's, you know, brutality in nature, that is reality in nature, but it doesn't mean we ought to model ourselves based on that and use that as our moral compass. Just because it is something doesn't mean we ought to be doing that. Um, so that's a famous idea. We're gonna move here to the utilitarians with Bentham and Mill. And utilitarianism is this consequentialist philosophy. You're focusing on the consequences of the action. Um, you're not as much concerned about, like Immanuel Kant, uh, Immanuel Kant's concerned about one's intentions, Emmanuel Kant's concerned about this moral truth out there and trying to pursue um, absolute morality. The utilitarians are more concerned about what's the end result, the consequences, and how that action impacts everybody. And so one idea with utilitarians like Bentham and Mill is they're concerned about lessening pain and increasing happiness. Um, Mill is the one that argues for looking at quality. It's not just happiness. Like it would be happy for all of you guys to get A's in this class. Everybody just gets an A, stop your word, yay. That's happiness for the largest majority, but it's not quality. So Mill adds to that caveat. We have to also consider quality and it's much more uh, meaningful to get an A if you earned it, you represent that you learned something and so forth. Now, Bentham is also famous for his statements, um, taking utilitarianism and applying it to animal rights. And I think when we get to that lesson plan, we'll talk about that. But what he said was, we need to also, when we're considering um, lessening the pain of others, place animals in that equation because they all actually do experience pain and any beings that experience pain need to be considered uh, in terms of utilitarianism. Okay, so we'll get to that later. Now we have Spinoza. Now Spinoza is a fascinating philosopher because he argues that everything is God, everything is divine. It's a pantheistic philosophy. And ethically, how does that impact us? Well, if everything is God or everything is divine, imagine how everything would be treated as such. You're not viewing the person down the street, you know, as that weirdo or as that threat to you. You're viewing him as a manifestation of the divine. Everybody gets treated in a completely radically transformed perspective. And it's very powerful philosophy in that sense. Uh, that pantheistic philosophy and the implications are significant. It really challenges us to treat everybody with the greatest and sense of respect and love and honor uh, because they're all manifestations of the divine or God. And it's really a philosophy that challenges egoism and challenges uh, Thomas Hobbes up here. It's not to act selfishly, but to act out of uh, complete honor and respect for everything and everyone around us. Now, Immanuel Kant here, now Immanuel Kant's a major player when it comes to ethics. He says that intentions matter. Um, so it's not just about the consequences. It's about, um, you know, not the end result of the action, but what I intended. I mean, if I didn't, you know, intend to cause harm or pain, but something is harmed or pain, you know, that needs to be considered. And ethics um, does not involve self-interest, but the principles of duty. So sometimes um, we're asked morally to do something that we really don't want to do. And, it, and it's, but we, out of a sense of duty and obligation, we follow what we think is the right thing to do. He thinks that's very admirable. If we're getting something out of it and we're following a sense of duty at the same time, it's not as admirable if it's a struggle. Once there's a struggle and it's really counter to what you want, but you're still doing it, that's when it's morally admirable. And um, one thing he said, it's very famous for the categorical comparative. I think I explained that already in another lesson plan, but this idea that we take our action that we're thinking of doing and universalizing it and saying, imagine the world if everybody acted that way, it can give us through reason insight whether that action should be morally um, honored and respected or not. So if everybody acted in a certain X way, uh, and, and, and the world is obviously a world you'd want to be part of, that's an insight into that action being something that would be morally acceptable. So that is called the categorical imperative. Categorical is all imperative. Everybody is to act that way. Okay, um, moving down here to Karl Marx. And we're almost done. I forgot when I started the Zoom, so I hope I'm within the 30 minutes. So Karl Marx is our famous philosopher that um, really a lot of people call him the economist or the political philosopher, but he's also a moral philosopher. And his Communist Manifesto, some people use, and I have used it in the past, as a ethical piece of writing. Um, it's used as an option for your research projects. A lot of these philosophers 
um, that I'm covering could be your research project. I'll talk about that in a minute. But for Marx, he um, argues that he really envisions a moral society. He really envisions a utopian society where there's not have and a have nots, but everybody is treated with a sense of justice and so forth. But the society that he's witnessing in his day and age is one of capitalism, and it's really taking an advantage, the bourgeoisie, over the proletariat, and enslaving the proletariat for the benefit of the bourgeoisie or the capitalists. And he'd like to change that situation, transform it. He never thought in his lifetime he witnessed it. Any form of Marxism that was set up in his lifetime, he thought was not at all what he envisioned. Um, it's more the ideal. But uh, morality, as in his day and age, he thought was set up to serve the ruling class. It was really not a fair, a just uh, world. Now, Frederick Nietzsche, or Nietzsche, he envisioned um, with the concept of the Ubermash, this highest, uh, excellent uh, human being, the human being of virtue. That is the goal. And how do we attain that level of becoming an Ubermash? It's a very positive view that humanity can aspire to become. And um, we, the Ubermesh is somebody who is a strong, intelligent, creative, um, artistic in many ways, um, individual who doesn't follow herd mentality, who doesn't just believe in ideas because they're told. It doesn't somebody who just follows what society tells them to do. It's not necessarily the rebel. It's just somebody who thinks they're on their own two feet. And um, the Ubermesh has indeed a sense of, of a morality, one could argue, but it's not the moral system that one may be used to. Um, the moral system in his day and age, he kind of flips upside down. And oftentimes in his day and age, he thought like the meek and the passive were honored, but he thinks that should be flipped, okay? That's the trans-evaluation of values is the concept. He flips it upside down and reevaluates them and says, instead of the meek and the passive being honored, we should have respect for that sense of strong character, that sense of creativity, that sense of independent thought, that should be honored. So it's a flipping of the moral system. And I loved this line of his, he has quote saying, the sign of a good person who lessens the shame of another. I think that's just such a powerful statement. I just threw that in there. But one passage I love of Frederick Nietzsche is his idea of the eternal reoccurrence passage. Um, it's, it's, it's called the eternal reoccurrence. That's the name of the passage, I said that wrong. But it's kind of an insight of how we are living our lives and if we're living our lives to our highest potential to the potential of the Ubermesh. And in the eternal reoccurrence, he says, imagine, and he, he has this uh, reference to the demon. A demon slept in, uh, slipped in one night into your window and turned the hourglass of eternity time and time again. So you had to relive each moment time and time again. Would that be a blessing to you or would that be a curse? If it's a curse, it's telling you that if you're living your life and it's a curse that you had to relive it time and time again for all eternity, you're not living your life to its highest potential. You're not living it well. You're not living it um, correctly. And if it's a blessing to you, it's kind of a litmus test to tell you that you, yes, you're living your life in a way, if you could relive it for all eternity, it's living it well. It's achieving that sense of virtue or excellence. And so it's a beautiful passage. I encourage you guys, um, actually, I think I have a film on it in the film section where uh, my husband took that passage and made a little film on it. There's another aspect of that passage that I thought was really cool, I just wanna share. He says, have, is there something, and I see if I can articulate this very clearly, is there something in your life that you'd be willing to live it all eternity as it's unfolded again and again, because whatever you have in your life is so meaningful to you, you love so dearly, it's so important to you that it makes all the past worthwhile and you realize you change one thing from the past, you wouldn't have this, whatever that be. And so that's very insightful. So if, if you're looking at it from that perspective, you can't look at past things of your life and say, oh, I wish A didn't happen, I wish B didn't happen, I wish C didn't happen. Because if you change one aspect of A, B, or C, whatever this is, I'm calling it X right here, wouldn't be. Because everything's intimately webbed and connected um, kind of the, the butterfly effect or the chaos theory idea that everything is so intimately connected that to where you are now is a result of all the past that's happened. And so that eternal reoccurrence passage is very powerful to say that even if bad things happen to us, and I'm sure all our lives are filled with that horrific stuff, um, one way or the other, car accidents, abuse, what have you, but you have a new take on it. You have this understanding that, okay, I will accept it as the tragedy of life because it got me where I am today. And that's just an interesting uh, philosophy he has there I really admire. So 
Moving to Sartre or Sartre, okay, French philosopher, you can kind of add that little R-E on there. He argues an interesting philosophy of existentialism. Existentialism is a philosophy of looking at human existence. And when you look at human existence, what he argues is that human existence is waking up to your radical freedom and there are no preset plans or nothing's pre-structured, that we are radically free. We don't choose our parents and all of that, but once we're born into the world, every action we do determines who and what we are. There's no set plan. There's no set dogma to follow. And, um, but with that radical freedom comes radical responsibility because everything I do creates who and what I am and creates and defines who and what a human being is possible of becoming. It defines humanity through, even through my own acts. I contribute to the definition of what it is to be a human being. And everything we do impacts everybody else. So with radical freedom comes radical responsibility and a lot of burden then is placed in our lap in terms of um, moral responsibility. So you can't blame God, you can't blame your parents, you can't blame your teachers. All of that empowerment is in our hands. He says it's a positive philosophy um, in that it's empowering, but it's a responsibility philosophy, absolutely. And I think that uh, the, that concludes the reading part of all the philosophers, but the uh, modern day neuroethics, we have a lesson plan on neuroethics where we look at um, kind of the new modern scientific take and understanding what's going on inside the biochemistry of our neural net and what, how that plays out in terms of moral philosophy. So looking at the required reading, we just covered a lot of that. Required films, let's see what we got here for you. So we start off, I, a lot of people love the trolley dilemma. It's very famous um, in philosophy. So we start off with that. We have some philosophers to look at. School of Life, School of Life, these are great. And then we have a 10 minute uh, Nietzsche film and then a crash course on Aristotle. And I did give some optional films here and I know I've got the eternal reoccurrence if I can find it, where is it? Hmm. I don't see it there. Well, you know what, I will put it up. Okay, because that's a cool one. I'm surprised I didn't put that up. I will put that up. Okay, and then your post question. So your post question very simply is to uh, having studied these different philosophers and schools of thought within Western ethics, um, talk about three of them, discuss their ideas, why you admire them, and then can you apply any of their ideas to your life? So section one, section two, three philosophers, kind of summary, admiration, application, if that makes sense. Okay, you guys, thank you so much for watching. Let me click out here. Let me go back and stop the Zoom, stop my Zoom. Stop share. Oh, there I do. Just hit that. That's easy. Okay. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you learned something next week or not next week. Next lesson plan on Eastern philosophy is much simpler and um, we'll get through that very easily. Okay. Thank you.